We're going to be going over lubrication and cooling systems. Lubrication systems are so important. There's just so many uh, close tolerance parts in today's engines that require the correct oil and it's got to be clean. And oil performs quite a few functions. Um, a barrier or a film to reduce friction. And our crankshafts and our camshafts actually float on oil. That's hydrodynamic suspension. Oil also acts as a shock absorber between parts. It has the ability to allow motion and load to be transferred to mating surfaces with a more subtle transfer. If, if it dries out, it's going to heat up and fail. So oil acts as a unique properties. Okay, And also, oil absorbs heat. So lubrication does an uh, enormous job in the engine. There's so much it's responsible for to keep the engine healthy and running reliably. So what we have is the oil being picked up, the flow being picked up from the oil pan. Typically, there's a screen in the pickup tube at the opening. It goes up to an oil pump. Um, engines have gear-driven gear pumps, or they have constant velocity. Uh, pumps that are out today that produce the same flow regardless of engine RPM. And it shows the oil going from the oil pump to the oil filter flowing through. And uh, here is showing the oil galleries overhead of the crankshaft. And the oil galleries are feeding the main bearing journals and the passageways that are drilled into the crankshaft are feeding the connecting rods. So that is the flow from the pan, oil pan, to the crankshaft. So then we have another branch that goes up to the overheads, our cam bearings, and we have other components there like hydraulic lifters. We have zero lash adjusters, and all of these overhead components rely on oil. Without clean and sufficient flow of oil, the overheads will wear out and fail. So uh, it's very important that we have the correct uh, service intervals and make sure that everything inside the engine in the oil side is clean. Oil has achieved a very significant amount of science and additives that are in oil today to reduce foam, um, to reduce aeration with oxidation. Whenever you mix oxygen into a liquid, there's changes in the properties. Um, varieties of detergents and dispersants, which is relatively um, balanced these days. They used to have non-detergent oil and uh, oils that had detergents and no dispersants, but now they've, uh, the last 10 or 15 years, they've been able to strike a balance. A viscosity index improver to keep the viscosity stable over the life of the oil. A pour point depressant so that the oil will move at lower temperatures. Corrosion and rust inhibitors, uh, oil does a big job. There's always a small amount of fuel and that gets into the uh, oil and occasionally a small amount of coolant or just moisture from condensation. So oil needs to protect the um, moving parts and the, and the um, parts that could possibly have some rust on them from moisture, so uh, the corrosion and rust inhibitors are helpful there. Also cohesion agents. There's engines uh, that sit for a while tend to have a dry, dry surfaces and critical uh, lubricated parts, so the cohesion agents allow for a thin film of oil to remain in places where no oil will normally drip down and leach out of that area. So the idea is uh, to use cohesion agents to help against dry starts. Okay, we have a, a Society of Automotive Engineers. They're gonna give the viscosity rating. And the um, this is in the center of the um, certification uh, uh, emblem. And the American Petroleum Institute is gonna give us the service S for Spark, and this is the latest um, oil standard. So you just want to make sure that 
in doing your uh, oil service that you're using the correct oil as specified by the manufacturer and it has the latest revision of quality standards. Um, vehicles today, automotive will have 020 in many of our um, automotive applications. In larger trucks and heavy duty trucks, there's a variety of oils that are used. The 1540 standard is somewhat going away as tolerances become um, much more uh, close tolerance in the engines. We're seeing um, applications with five and zero weight oil. There is 1030 oil for fleets, and we're seeing that the um, viscosity is driven by the manufacturing capability. So uh, oils years ago, was, many years ago, were, were single weight. Multigrade came in, and the science of oil has really improved oil. And it's typical to get um, extended oil drains in automotive as compared to years ago. The American Petroleum Institute, S spark, C for compression, uh, diesel, and the second letter represents the most um, latest revision. Here we have a list that goes back quite a few years of lubrication systems. You just want to make sure that uh, you read what the manufacturer specifies for that engine. And not all oils are backward compatible. So we want to make sure that we're using the correct oil. It's typically in yellow letters on the oil cap. But if you're not sure, look it up in your service literature, your, your Mitchell Pro Demand, and make sure that you have the correct oil as indicated by the manufacturer's specifications. Other systems, international system, international lubricant standard, um, ACO, which is a European vehicle manufacturer standards, JSO, which is uh, Asian, Japanese automotive um, standard organization. Um, synthetic oils today are uh, highly desirable. Uh, they're usually full synthetic. Uh, they, there are still a few manufacturers using blend, which is a combination of both synthetic and um, petroleum-based oil. Uh, synthetic oils have greater uh, friction resistance. Uh, they operate in a wider temperature range, which is um, excellent for cold operation and also for hot operation. So it works in both ends of the um, thermal spectrum. Um, they're more resistant to breakdown, sludge formation, and oxidation. So synthetic oils are becoming the choice as a lubricant. And extended oil drain intervals. Um, uh, many people and manufacturers go uh, 5,000 miles in full synthetic. And previously, we were going, uh, the industry was going 3,000 for petroleum-based oil, where synthetics are going to five. Some manufacturers uh, push it to seven or 8,000 miles or greater based on the service that the engine is in. But um, the service industry uh, likes to see more um, frequent oil changes so that the inside of the engine is uh, protected against any uh, sludge or dirt that could happen. Synthetics are more expensive, but they are still cheap in the long run. They um, provide the protection, and doing a few extra oil changes is far more cost effective than replacing an engine. We have the gear rotor style pump that has one less uh, one less uh, rotor surface than the outside, and we have the typical gear driven pump. Um, the gear rotor is easier to integrate with overhead cam engines, and the gear type delivers a higher volume, so it's a trade off there. Here's a typical uh, cam or crankshaft uh, driven. Um, Oil pump, this is a traditional style uh, oil pump that would be uh, gear uh, pick pickup and gear driven with helical gears on the camshaft. Okay, this is a uh, gear driven on the crankshaft. Um, 
it has gears making the oil flow, and there's a, this has a built-in oil pressure regulator, which is a spring valve. Oh, here it is. Uh, typically, the oil pump is going to hold a pressure based on how much the spring is being compressed. So if the oil pressure exceeds the, um, the rating, the spring is going to open or close the valve, so it'll adjust the pressure accordingly. Oil filters. Um, we have the basic large mesh in the oil pump pickup, and modern engines use a full flow uh, filtration system. For oil flows through the filter before being delivered through the engine. So the oil is going in the, the outside of the filter, going through the filter element or filter media, and then going up through the uh, top and back out. Here's an inlet check valve and a, a drain back valve so that oil will remain in the filter when the engine's shut off. And a bypass valve, if for any reason the filter becomes plugged, the bypass valve would put unfiltered oil into the main engine um, oil galleries. And this allows lubrication to continue. Um, it's better than uh, having an oil starvation situation because then you'd have failure, uh, a quick failure of the rotating assembly. Oil coolers utilized on engines to do, uh, for heat transfer of the oil. Um, there may be uh, oil to air or coolant to oil, but oil to air is um, utilized, in a, say, for the transmission. You have oil on one side of the transmission cooler and air passing through the fins on the other side. Typically on turbocharged and supercharged engines, as well as engines designed for towing and hauling, they have the additional oil cooler. So you're going to have um, additional oil in that um, oil service and you need to be aware of what the uh, engine is rigged with. Oil is drawn up into the pump, pressurized and set to the filter. It continues to the galleries, to the crankshaft main bearings, and then up to the overheads in the camshaft bearings, and oil flows through the bearings to the critical components. It's an example. They have to understand that the oil initially is going to the main, main bearings that are in the, on the crankshaft. So those are your mains. And the holes that are drilled into the crankshaft will take the oil from the main bearing surface and go to the connecting rod surface. So the um, big end of the connecting rod is getting oil on this journal from the main bearing journal. And this is where the oil pressure and the uh, oil bearing clearance between the polished journal and the oil bearing that's in the um, mains and the connecting rods is very critical. That specification has to be held to create the correct amount of oil pressure and have the correct amount of uh, lubrication for the crankshaft so it can be suspended in oil and can run correctly. And if, if, if there's any blockage in any of these galleries for any reason, um, a quick failure could definitely occur. Okay, here's a uh, oil drain video that we're not going to be able to launch. Oil pressure testing. A mechanical gauge typically has some pipe plug, plug adapters, typically eighth inch, quarter inch, or three eighths inch um, NPT threaded um, adapters. They screw into the block, and you have a, a, a manual gauge that'll um, you'll be able to determine if the engine's producing oil pressure. And if you have a good reading of, say, 30 or 40 pounds or higher at the um, mechanical gauge, you know that your problem is from the oil pressure sender into the module and up to the gauge. So it's uh, want to make sure that you can determine if the engine has 
oil pressure and the problems not in the engine or the problem is in the engine. So that's important to make sure that you're determining and dividing the problem of do you have oil pressure. Common waste oil pump can be driven, crankshaft, or from a um, gear from the camshaft, chain, or timing belt. So you can have a variety of uh, methods to turn the oil pump. Oil change process. The engine must be warm and not running. You remove the fill cap, the drain plug and the drain, remove the oil filter. Now some of us who are fussy, we will poke a hole or two in the oil filter and allow that to drain while the engine is draining. It's a bit neater. Okay, you always want to check the oil filter coming off that you got the gasket off. Occasionally, the oil filter uh, flat O-ring can stick to the flange that's on the oil filter flange assembly, and it's possible to double gasket. So you want to double check and make sure that when you take off the old oil filter that you have the flat O-ring that's on it. Okay. Uh, typically, we put we fill the oil filter with oil and let it settle a little bit and reinstall uh, the filter. It's usually snug and then a quarter turn is typical. You install the drain plug. Drain plugs that go into aluminum drain pans have approximately 30 to 32 pounds of um, torque. You want to check with the manufacturer and make sure that you know the correct torque for the oil drain pan plug. And you fill the crankcase with the recommended amount and uh, rated oil. Start the engine. You always want to make sure that you have oil pressure and that there's no leaks. You shut, shut off the engine and let it rest for five minutes and check the oil level. So which components help protect the engine should the oil filter become clogged? The bypass valve. So the bypass valve will at least allow oil to flow to the engine to critical rotating parts and um, bypass the plugged filter. We move into cooling systems. Cooling systems, it's all about heat transfer to protect the engine. It also allows for a quick warm up to increase fuel economy. Engines like to run at uh, optimum temperatures. And it's also helpful with emissions and uh, will increase oil, um, oil life, but also engine life. Uh, we have basic components, coolant, radiator cap, cooling fan, recovery system, uh, coolant jackets, passages, and hoses, water pump, thermostat, and heater core. Cooling systems use a combination of water and antifreeze as the coolant. Water alone does not provide protection across the adequate temperature range since the uh, boiling at 212 degrees Fahrenheit and freezing at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So it also leads to excessive rust and corrosion. And it doesn't really lubricate anything. And uh, antifreeze coolant provides protection against extreme temperatures. Also includes additives to protect against corrosion and provide lubricity. Most systems use a 50-50 mixture of water and antifreeze. Uh, today, the antifreeze that we, uh, we buy for fleets and we buy for automotive applications is um, distilled deionized water. And it will go extended drain intervals because it's a very stable product. Um, very few applications are requiring uh, having to mix distilled water and um, antifreeze. So that's pretty much gone away. Okay, um, ethyl glycol is typically uh, the older style of coolant. Most common is poisonous and it does change. Uh, it is electrolytic reaction, reactive. So there's a little bit about electrolysis is that the a straight current that is in the engine and variety of electrical uh, components 
ends up traveling through the coolant and will deliver electrons of current to weaker metals, which will uh, erode and dissolve eventually. So coolant can deliver unwanted um, electrolytic or electrolysis action throughout the engine. There are special test leads to check for it, but um, it is one of the concerns about ethyl glycol. The uh, more modern coolant is propylene glycol. It's much less poison, it's safer, but um, most manufacturers have not approved its use. Um, that is changing slightly. Uh, organic additive technology, extended life coolants are popular. Many variations exist among uh, manufacturers, and color doesn't really indicate anything. It's the ASTM that it has um, assigned to it. Here we have an overlay of boiling and freezing graph for today's coolant. But what's important here is what's the flow? How does heat transfer occur in a radiator? Well, this coolant running at uh, engine temperature, hopefully just a little above thermostat temperature, with air passing through the uh, core on the outside and the, the tubes containing the coolant running through the core on the inside. So that's how your heat transfer occurs. And they could be downflow, but most of these are cross-flow radiators today. And many of them include the uh, transmission oil cooler in some place, you typically at the bottom or on the side, so that you'll have another circuit in there where uh, you have an air to transmission oil cooler in that um, same component. Okay, filler cap, uh, cooling fins, core tube, typical radiator uh, when they get uh, clogged and when they have um, obstructions is when you begin having uh, problems with the flow. The flow, ha it can't have a lot of restriction. It's got to be pretty uh, clean inside without any um, uh, residue. Radiator cap's important. For every pound of radiator cap pressure, it increases the boiling point approximately three to four degrees. Okay, a vacuum valve prevents the system collapse during cool down. So if you didn't have the vacuum valve, and because as the coolant uh, loses temperature, it begins to contract and the upper uh, radiator hose would be um, collapsed if you didn't have that vent. And that's also a telltale that your thermostat isn't um, working correctly if your upper radiator hose collapses when uh, the coolant uh, loses temperature. Typical uh, flow with the tank and the cap spring, and you have your recovery tank or your overflow tank. It's going to get um, coolant sent to it when, every, when, the, when the engine's running and it heats up. So you have that recovery tank's got a high and a low on it. So you want to make sure that you have the correct level in that tank at all times. Vacuum relief, pictured here against the thermostat. And we have the full hot and full cold. Very important that the tank, the reserve tank or the recovery tank has the correct level of coolant in it. Otherwise, it's not going to work correctly. Some tanks are pressurized and the radiator does not have its own cap, radiator cap, and the, the cap is on the reserve tank and it makes the tank pressurized. Heater core is essentially like a small radiator that has uh, air flowing through it. Uh, this is a pretty uh, worn example here, but it basically is another circuit in the cooling system that allows uh, warm or hot coolant to pass through with air being pushed through by the HVAC system, and it will direct warm air to the passenger compartment and to the defroster application. Here's an example 
of a full flow circuit here. The air will flow through. The circulating pump will move coolant from the lower radiator hose um, up to the engine. And we have the thermostat will will open at temperature. So in the when the engine's cold, the thermostat is cold. The coolant flow stays on the engine, so the engine can build significant temperature. So it'll open the thermostat and begin to pass it through the radiator. The thermostat will begin to open at its rated number that's stamped on it, and it takes um, about 10 to 20 degrees, depending upon the application, for it to fully open and have full flow through the radiator. The shown the heater core, essentially another uh, circuit here that's got a control valve and we'll have a fan behind it and it'll push the hot air into the um, cabin and um, into the um, blend area, blend doors up to the uh, defrost for the windshield. So uh, this is another circuit and uh, that has to be uh, also very clean. If you get a restriction here, you're gonna have problems with your heat and you defrost. The water pump, circulating pump, is typically driven by a belt, uh, accessory drive belt or a timing belt, depending upon the layout and the application of your engine. The thermostat's gonna control the flow through the radiator based on temperature. It's pretty straightforward. Here we have open and closed. Here, here it's closed and the coolant will stay on the engine block. Once it begins to open, it'll allow coolant to begin to flow to the radiator. And once it's fully opened, it'll allow full flow to the radiator. This is a um, typical water temperature gauge. It's running about 190, which is typical, just above typical thermostat today. Okay, parallel flow cooling system. Coolant flows through the engine block, cylinder head, and around each cylinder. Coolant can then flow through the thermostat to the radiator. So all of the cooling circuits get full flow or parallel flow. Series flow flows through the entire engine block and then through the entire cylinder head. Coolant can then flow through the thermostat to the radiator. So it's the engine block first, and then the cylinder head, and then upper radiator hose for the uh, series flow. Reverse flow cooling system. Coolant flows through the cylinder heads first, then through the engine block. It's more efficient because cylinder heads operate at a higher temperature than the block because they have um, combustion chambers in them. So that's uh, a more efficient system. Cooling system service, never remove a radiator cap. That loss of pressure will cause the coolant to boil and it could be uh, very dangerous for you. Inspect coolant to proper level for signs of rust or contamination. And uh, you could check it with uh, coolant test strips, coolant hydrometer or refractometer. Refractometer uh, seems to be the tool of choice because it works on um, in other applications other than coolant. You want to inspect for any signs of leak. System can be pressure tested with a pressure testing to, uh, tool that'll pump. You, if, if you have a 15 PSI cap, you unscrew the cap and you put the pressure tester on where the cap goes and you pressurize it to system pressure and you can check for leaks. Okay, many shops use flushing machines to change coolant and just don't want to let any of the old coolant get back into the engine block. Special bleeding procedures, depending upon the model vehicle, this will be called out in your service literature because they may have um, procedures that you follow to turn um, bleed points open or you have to turn on the um, HVAC uh, at various times in order to allow the coolant to dissipate any air that might be uh, in the system. So this will be called out in your service procedures. Bleed screw here. Most common type of coolant 
ethylene glycol. Basic coolant flow through the system in a non-reverse flow system. It's your upper radiator hose and your thermostat housing that's on the top of the engine. Coolant travels through the block, then the heads, and out through the thermostat to the radiator and is pumped back into the engine via the water pump. Cooling fans. A variety of fans is necessary when the vehicle stop or operating at a low vehicle speed above 30 miles per hour. Many vehicles receive enough airflow from the movement of the vehicle, so it's not necessary to have a fan. Um, newer vehicles still rely on a cooling fan for supplemental airflow. Um, aerodynamic body designs allow more air to flow around the vehicle, and smaller grill openings reduce natural airflow to the radiator. It's important to know that any obstruction at the radiator can cause a uh, what's called a failure in range. You could have be at the top of the heat uh, limit, the heat threshold, and do damage to a vehicle if you have obstruction um, to the airflow. The shrouds that are around the radiator and the radiator fan are important. They're engineered to make sure that the airflow is traveling in the right um, volume and the right direction. Uh, any adaptation to the um, shrouds that are around the fan and the radiator uh, could do damage to the uh, cooling system. Here's a belt-driven um, typical fan with a fan clutch on this one, cooling, water pump pulley. Okay, fan clutches, use silicone fluid to control the fan uh, clutch or engagement. When it's cold, the speed is slow, reduces noise and speeds warm up. And when warm up, the speed increases based on the expansion from heat. Here's another example of it. Electric cooling fans are um, typically used these days. They have um, much more of a controllable uh, mechanism. They have a uh, coolant temperature sensor that it can run off and the modules, uh, power train control module um, can be in charge of closing the uh, relay and enacting the fan once we get a temperature uh, above threshold. Here's an example of a cooling fan with a low speed and a high speed fan relay on the right side and the left side fan, uh, typical in cars today. And um, the, the powertrain control module is going to be in charge of the uh, switching based on um, engine coolant temperature. There's a uh, adaptation of the uh, cooling fan being um, activated is the other side, hot at all times. Fan shrouds, very important to um, direct the airflow. Purpose of the fan clutch, allows fan speed to based on temperature, reduces drag and noise when operations not needed. Warning systems and indicators, warning cooling and lubrication system problems to the driver. Typically, a gauge or a warning light. Some systems use electronic message sensor. But we want to make sure that the uh, coolant is within temperature range and that the uh, lubrication system is functioning correctly. Gauge sensors, thermistors um, are typically uh, positive a negative temperature coefficient uh, thermistors, and um, we also have a piezo resistive sensors change resistance with pressure to operate oil pressure gauge. So we have a variety here of neg negative temperature coefficient thermistors and piezo resistive sensors that will uh, sense pressure and uh, keep the gauges um, ready to. Um, indicate any failure that may occur.
warning lights. Oil pressure switch opens the circuit and turns off the light above 3 PSI, which is a very low threshold. Temperature switch closes and turns on the warning light at predetermined temperature. That is all handled through the powertrain control module. Most automotive and heavy trucks use a temperature gauge sending unit with what type of sensor? It's a thermistor. It's typically a negative temperature coefficient thermistor. As the temperature rises, the resistance goes down, and that signal is processed by the body control module and will um, set off a, the appropriate warning light or code, whichever uh, is necessary.